All right, so welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. We've got a Jim to Crag presentation um, by the lovely Jonathan Morell. He's a climbing buyer at the Mountain Shop and has a lot of knowledge. Um, you also are at Multnomah Athletic Club. Yeah, I run the climbing gym and outdoor programs at Multnomah Athletic Club. So he'll be going over some gear basics for kind of transitioning from the gym to um, outside climbing, also education of climbing, um, building relationships, and a few other things. So with that, I will let Jonathan take it away. Um, one thing I should mention, we're going to answer questions at the end of every section. So feel free to type things into the chat that you're wondering, and then we'll get to them as he wraps things up. Um, I think you wanted to start with a question for the people on the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, well, um, thanks everybody. My name is Jonathan. Um, uh, one of the things about being an educator that I've learned is that if you're not teaching to the audience that you're uh, working with, it's basically just talking to yourself. So what would be helpful for me uh, as you file in is to just type in a little bit like one thing that you wanna hear more about tonight. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that we spend a little more time on that. Otherwise, I'm just gonna be talking to this computer. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, my name is Jonathan and I, um, I've been climbing since college. And uh, so that, oh, you don't know how long ago that was. Um, it was a long time ago, uh, but I've been a climbing instructor for about 15 years. Uh, I have a master's degree in adventure education and um, that's allowed me to, to dive into kind of the details of, of being an educator. And I'm also an AMGA, uh, I've, my certifications have run out, but um, I am an AMGA guide. And so I've piled on like a lot of really good uh, tools and I'm looking forward to sharing those with you tonight. Um, cool, go to the next one. All right, so a little bit about the plan for tonight. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about my experiences and why I think climbing is awesome. Um, we're gonna do a little bit, uh, I'm gonna give you a template to look at uh, how to plan and prepare for a trip. Um, we're gonna talk about gear, which is always the most fun, right? Um, and then I wanna help you think about like, well, what, what stuff do I need to buy next or first? <clears throat> and give you some idea of, of, uh, of what would be a good, some criteria for buying those things. Uh, we're gonna go over some knots and hitches. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on that, but I am gonna show you why they're important. I'm gonna talk a little bit about crag ethics. Um, and then ways for you to like foster and build relationships um, so you can get climbing partners and then kind of talk about next steps. So with that, let's jump in. So when I first started climbing in college, you can go to the next one. Uh, when I first started climbing in college, I was terrified. So I, the first time I climbed outside was at Smith Rock. And uh, I remember getting about, I don't know, 10 feet up uh, off the ground and I just, was gripping the rock so hard and I didn't want to go up and I, I didn't want to fall. So I just like, just like had my face just like pressed up against the rock and I was, I was really scared. Um, but I had a friend that was climbing with me, a mentor that continues to mentor me to this day, just kind of coach me through uh, that moment and has continued to kind of coach and mentor me in my climbing journey uh, and helping me meet other people. And I've since like built relationships and, and continue and mentored others. And so what I wanna convey to you tonight is that, you know, if this is something that you're getting into at first and, and you're, you know, nervous about it, that's fine. Um, but what is like so valuable about climbing outside is you generally do it with someone else. And so I also wanna give you some, some tips and tools to think about like, well, how can I be like a compassionate and supportive coach uh, to the people that I climb with? Um, so while I had sort of a um, stressful introduction to climbing outside, um, we have so many great places in the greater like Portland area. So I've, I've, there's a few pictures here. Uh, one is Horse Thief, it's out near the Dalles. Uh, one is um, Beacon Rock, which is on just on the Washington side. Uh, another one is the Honeycombs, which are, is in Southern Oregon. Uh, near Medford, uh, Smith Rock, obviously. And then the uh, last one pictured there is uh, Brown's Bluff. So 
really within like an hour of um, of Portland, there's three or four places to go. And then within two or three hours, uh, there's a bunch more. So um, yeah, you can go to the next one, Jeff. So I've been able to like travel the world and meet people and climbing has really been the vehicle for that. And so, um, so as I talked about earlier, um, like meeting people and building those relationships has, has been one of the like greatest benefits to me of climbing. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's really like just transformed the landscape of, of the people that I have been able to spend time with. I've met people who, you know, didn't speak English, but spoke rock climbing. And we were able to kind of like negotiate the communication uh, and break that barrier, like via the movement on rock. And it's, uh, it, it's been kind of unlike any other experience that I've had. I played baseball in high school, but you know, that didn't really, that doesn't allow me to like build relationships because I know what a, uh, a shortstop is. So um, it's, uh, it's it, the relationship component has been so powerful for me. The other thing is just like the physical movement and um, you know, maintaining flexibility and strength and all those kinds of things is what it makes um, climbing so important to me. Last thing I'll say about this, I can go to the next one. And then the last thing I'll say about this is there is a um, sort of a, a marriage of my body and my mind, which I live, a, spend a lot of time in my head. And so when I'm climbing, I bring those two things together in ways that I don't always do in my life. So uh, I'm really grateful to climbing and the relationships that I've made over the years. And um, I think it's the best and I hope you do too. All right, we'll keep going. Yeah, so what I, I wanted to give you a little rundown, just a couple minute rundown of kind of like where we've come from and maybe where we're headed in climbing education. And um, while these things, I'm gonna kind of go through them linear, linearly, they are, they do happen in cycles. So as you interact and build relationships with people at the crag, um, maybe you'll hear some of these themes as people kind of talk about the way that they do things or how they came up in rock climbing. And so early on, we had a lot of Europeans come to the United States, the immigrant story. Um, and a lot of them, um, one thing the Europeans do really well is alpinism. So they brought a lot of those techniques and those tools uh, and brought them to, to the United States. So places like France, Italy, Switzerland, um, those were like hugely influential in North American climbing culture. And that's when a lot of like the climbing clubs kind of blew up in the United States, like, you know, even Mazama's American Alpine Club, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then we kind of fast forward to what would be called like the dirt bag era. And this is where climbing is passed on like through friends, friend groups. And so you have mentors that, um, that you spend your summers with or you're in kind of a notorious one is, you know, the group of climbers uh, in Yosemite. And so, you know, they would go to college, with, you know, and then every time that they could, they'd be down uh, in the valley, just like grinding it out. Um, and so it was really a time of like counterculture. They were there to kind of set themselves apart from like the tourists and, um, and it was really like, but it was also kind of an in-group out-group thing. So there's a lot of like kind of initiation and this is where it's mostly like white and male dominated. And so women like Lynn Hill um, were really pioneers in that era of kind of, um, of feeling like, you know, she had to like compete with the boys, but then obviously like she was better than a lot of them um, and really leveraged her strengths in order to be successful in that environment. So um, competition was also a really part of, uh, of kind of the dirtbag era. But knowledge being passed down through friendships kind of in these real in-group out groups is kind of like how things are being taught. Um, and then the next one we have is, um, so Yvonne, Yvonne Chouinard, who everybody knows owns Patagonia, uh, also used to own Black Diamond. And so uh, uh, there was a, a litigation and a, a lawsuit against Yvonne where he basically had to, in order to save Black Diamond, he had to sell it. And so this is what kind of marks the split between Patagonia and, and Black Diamond. And not that that's important, but what is important is that, um, and, and the, the lawsuit had to do with a, a client or a, a user of a harness um, that had, had uh, gone to the bathroom essentially in a snowstorm and put the harness on wrong and stepped out on the edge on a rope team and fell off and, and there was a fatality. So, 
um, the courts deemed that that uh, Black Diamond was responsible and and uh, and so this kind of ushered to this era of gear standards uh, and uh, kind of changing the way that gear is made and we kind of are starting to catch up with some of the Europeans in terms of like standards and practices. But what's interesting about this time is that while these tools are being developed to make like climbing more safe and uh, more innovative, like the education lags. And I might not get into that, but just know that like the education in this, in this era is not keeping up with the technology. Um, and then the, the next era is like the climbing will kill you era, which is not untrue. But uh, this is an era where things are very dogmatic. And so lessons could sound like you have to do it this way or you'll die. Um, and there's a huge, also a huge emphasis on safety, which is great, and educating people about how dangerous climbing is, which is so true. Um, and then the, the knowledge of these places are largely held within institutions. So you had like clubs and organizations and guides that kind of held this knowledge. And a lot of times we're very dogmatic about it. Um, and then we have the climbing gym explosion um, and, and it's great, like more people are coming into climbing and uh, there is a, a high impact on the natural environment as more people are going outside. The other thing is it's more inclusive, like more people are getting involved, mostly in urban centers that are interested in climbing and have access to a gym and that's great. So we're getting like all these new users. Um, and then kind of the last era that we're in and also, like I said, it's got sort of a circular period is, um, um, and what we wanna to emphasize tonight is not telling you like, this is how you have to do it or you're gonna die, but more like, hey, here's a box of tools and we want you to um, use those tools to make good decisions. Um, and we want you to enter mentoring relationships so that you're in a journey towards mastery rather than just using learning one way to do things and then just doing that for the rest of your climbing career. Um, the other thing that's great about this era is that uh, there's a lot of free content. We're gonna go over some good content and cause there's a lot of dated or kind of like just silly stuff out there. Um, and then the last thing that kind of about this era is there's an emphasis on, on affinity groups, which is great. And so we're fine, we're seeing more uh, specialized like organizations for uh, different groups, ethnicities and, and identities uh, that we just haven't seen before. So this is a really interesting and ripe era for education. Okay, so um, so here's a, a, um, a template of like planning an adventure. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it, but um, uh, location, what your objective is, how are you gonna get there, access, weather, emergency plan, um, what does that say? Oh yeah, what gear you need, like other gear, uh, what might be the human impact, what are some like cool things I might get out of it, and then other considerations. And so these are the, t these are the things that you want to start, um, uh, to start building in a, uh, your internal knowledge of so that you can um, begin to, again, be, um, be part of a good partnership with your partner in kind of figuring these things out so that you can be that work collaboratively. And the thing is about being a new climber is a lot of times you're going with someone that knows a lot and it can be often, it can be uh, probable even that you um, are really leaning on their knowledge. And so this is a way for you to be collaborative and helpful in, um, in that partnership by kind of answering some of these questions. And honestly, like a lot of climbers aren't very thoughtful about this kind of stuff. You know, even just like, well, what permits do we need? Or what's the approach like? Or, you know, should I, um, should I be wearing Crocs at the crag? Or do I need, or, you know, do I need flip flops for the approach? Like these are the kinds of things that will help you set you up for success. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about gear. Um, so let's just talk about harnesses. Um, this is gonna be a mandatory thing that you're gonna need in order to enjoy climbing. So um, if you don't have one, uh, we're just gonna hit the highlights and I'm gonna show you a few examples. Um, so one of the things you're gonna want to do, and this is one of the tips and tools that will carry on throughout the presentation, is you want one that's UIA and CU approved. Um, so this is a third party certification 
that uh, companies pay uh, these organizations to test their gear and say, yes, this meets or exceeds standards and we are gonna put our name on it and tell your customers that this is a good item. And so how do you check that? So every harness that you buy um, should come with a label. So this just happens to be uh, Petzl Ajama. And on these labels, you will see see that CE something, something, something number. So that is an, an indicator that the CU has certified this harness uh, as meeting or exceeding standards. Um, and this one also has a QR code. It looks like you, if you scan that, it's gonna tell you some things. I didn't scan it, so maybe you can scan it and tell me some things. Um, but yeah, so you wanna make sure that you're buying one from a reputable manufacturer and that it's approved by one of these organizations. The other thing you can do is always check the data sheet that comes with gear. And while it's in 47 languages, uh, generally there's one that'll work for you. Um, so the next thing is buy one that fits. So try them on. Um, uh, there are people who are coming in all shapes and sizes, and this is a, a great era of climbing where more and more people are getting into it and they don't all fit the, you know, white male, six foot, 165 pounds. Um, and so the, the industry is catching up um, with, with the different types of people that are showing up to the crag. So that's great. So you should try on trying a harness. Another one that fits your objectives and then also just one that looks cool as hell. Um, and um, I'll show you mine. It's a little dated but this is a wild country uh, harness and there's not much to it. It's got some gear loops. Uh, it is a, it's a one buckle design. So there's one buckle on the, uh, on the waist and then two buckles on the legs. I find that the fixed gear loops on leg loops don't fit my legs, they're too narrow. Um, and so I'm six foot, about 135 pounds, and I have to buy extra small harnesses just for my, for my waist. Um, and so I need a, an adjustable leg loop and, um, and then I need a, a small harness because that's what fits me. One of the things that the industry also does, and this is not um, uncommon just to uh, climbing, but most harnesses are built kind of on a, on a male fit model, if you will. And so this uh, is an example of a camp harness. This is the Energy Nova. And camp developed this uh, strictly uh, from the ground up to fit like a woman's body or fit a body that has a, a little wider hips and wider thighs. Um, and so this is a good, a good option and it just is cut a little bit different. And it's not necessarily just for women. Uh, men might find it if they fit a certain body type. And this is another reason why you just need to try stuff on. Um, and then, you know, don't, no need to get hung up on like, is this for men or is this for women? A lot of times it's just the color. But this one in particular uh, is a good option uh, for climbers that are looking something specifically that was built uh, on a kind of a female platform. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about gear inspection. So uh, specifically as it results, res uh, it um, pertains to your harness. Um, so um, the, the manufacturer's recommendation is that gear that is soft goods that are 10 years old should be destroyed and thrown out. Um, at five years, you need to inspect it every year. And so it is important that you have an intimate connection to your harness so that you can stay connected to the earth of how old it is and um and it's and and its use and so it's hard to see but like my belay loop is getting kind of fuzzy and that's actually not a problem but it is an indication of where so i want to be aware of that uh, as that as i continue this continues to be the most um, used part of my harness and the other thing i'm going to be looking for is um i'm going to be checking the buckles and just making sure that the, the, uh, the webbing where it runs over the buckle 
this is actually kind of getting a little more fuzzy than I'd like. So, you know, I might be in the market for a, for a new harness this year uh, for those reasons. Um, but in general, um, those are kind of the, the wear points that you're looking for and the, 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 the iteration in which you want to start inspecting your harness. Okay. All right, so let's talk about carabiners. There are so many and it is kind of silly. Um, but I just want to give you, again, a, a toolbox with which to, to make your own decisions, make educated decisions about, uh, about carabiners. And I'm just going to walk you through some of the differences that are out there. So let me go ahead and take the screen. Would you want to unshare it? Do you want them to see those? Okay, so here we have some examples. Um, I'm going to start with these uh, these HMS carabiners. So we've got three examples of what are called HMS carabiners. It's a German word that they've turned into an acronym. I don't remember what it is, but um, HMS essentially in German means uh, a device that holds a hitch. And a particular hitch that, that this will hold is a munter hitch and a clove hitch. We'll get to those later and why they're important, but just know that these bigger diameter um, carabiners are uh, necessary in order to, to pull that up, to, to attach yourself uh, with those hitches. Um, and then uh, this one in particular uh, is like a round stock. Uh, I like it because it generates a little bit more friction, which oftentimes means more control. And then this one is what's like considered like I-beam technology. So you can see how they've kind of cut out part of the carabiner in order to save weight. Um, and so while this one is lighter than this one, this one I a lot of times I feel like gives me more control, especially like when I'm lowering someone. Um, and this is just an example of a, a mini carabiner. And so we've got, We've got HMS style um, mini parabiner, which also has a similar shape. It's just smaller. Uh, so it's also an HMS style. Um, then we have uh, D, D carabiners. Uh, this is an offset D. Um, and this is a good carabiner to connect things with things. Um, and so whether that's connecting me to an anchor, uh, connecting, um, connecting anchors together. Uh, there's a lot of really good applications for an offset D and this one in this case is a, is a screw gate. Um, so yes, I should have said like, these are examples of locking carabiners, but here we go. Um, and then some non-lockers. Um, there's a lot of different non-lockers out there and I'm just gonna point out two small things in these. Um, these are that, that H-frame or I-beam technology. And so they're, they're pretty light. Uh, this one has a hook. I don't even know you can see that. Um, kind of has a, a hook here, um, um, but also like a really narrow nose. So this is really good in like getting into into like bolts or things that are really narrow. Um, so I like that. They also make it in a version with no hook. So you kind of see that. Um, Kind of this like no snag situation but in large part like non-locking carabiners are non-locking carabiners i like these because they're full size uh, they make them a lot smaller than this i just like it because it feels good in my hand and it feels secure when i clip into things so a lot of options out there um, and it's just important that you kind of know uh, what what a thing is you know what the principles with which to make good decisions. And so, and you will need a collection of all those carabiners. So you will need a collection of a HMS style. You'll need some offset Ds and you'll need some, some non-lockers. And we'll get into kind of the quantities of those things uh, towards the end. Uh, and then a couple um, other ones, this is a locking oval. This is like the oldest uh, style. This is what like Chenard was making, uh, and the early Black Diamond era was a was an oval carabiner because it's super strong and super easy to make. Um, 
And then there are some specialty ones. Uh, Edelred is a really good company that makes some really interesting equipment. Um, and so this is a locking carabiner that has a switch on it. I'm pushing down with my thumb here and opening the gate. Oh, it's kind of cool. Um, it also has a, a rope capture uh, bar. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, and then this is uh, Petzl's uh, Freno, and it is specifically designed to use for the, with the Grigri. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, but it is a two-stage locker. So I've got to twist it before it opens, and it's got this interesting little capture over here. Um, and then uh, Mammut has this big HMS style thing with this gate, um, and the gate is similar to the rope capture on this Edelred carabiner, uh, but it won't lock unless it's closed. So it's a, another kind of like feature that will give you some security. Okay, so those are the different kinds of carabiners. Um, you can kind of flip it back up, Jason. Do you want to show the video or? Yeah, yeah. Share your slides. Mm -hmm. That's all right. So, um, so let's just take a little minute to kind of look at some of these carabiners in detail so that we can go over some of what these letters and numbers mean. So here we go, we're gonna try this. I don't know if you can see that, but there are some numbers uh, and some shapes on here and those are important to know. Um, if you're able to see that, you can also see that it is also uh, has a CE number and it also has a UIAA certification. So it's another symbol that you'll come to recognize as a, as a third party verification that these are great and good to climb. Um, everything in the climbing world is in meters or the metric system and kilonewtons is one of those things. So kilonewtons you can think of as like force pounds or weight and movement. Um, and so it's not like, so it's 200, mm -hmm, 240, force pounds is one kilonewton. Let me check my math on that one. But, um, and so it's not like 240 pounds pulled this way, it's 240 pounds with an acceleration. Um, so this carabiner, the braking strength is 21 kilonewtons. So if anybody's got a calculator, approximately 240 force pounds times 21, it's kind of a lot of weight. So on a static load, you know, this probably can only carry two elephants. Um, so this is a really strong carabiner. Now there's another symbol on here that looks a little bit like the gate opening. And that means that when this gate is open, it changes the strength of this carabiner. It goes from 21 to seven kilonewtons. And then the other thing is, is there's another one with arrows pointing out this way. And this is also seven kilonewtons when it, the load pulls out along the sides. So going back to our HMS carabiner with this uh, gate on it. Um, so one of the benefits of a carabiner like this is that when you close it, it keeps the load running up and down the spine and so that it actually can't, the rope can't pull outward. And so like using a carabiner like this will always maximize the strength, which is keeping it closed and keeping it oriented straight up and down. So kind of some cool stuff, right? Um, so those are some, some tools uh, just to be thinking about carabiners. I wanted to show you, uh, so inspecting carabiners. And uh, so the manufacturer's recommendation is that anytime the gate or the screw or the locking mechanism is damaged, that it should be retired. And if there are more than three millimeters of wear. So, you know, the paint is a millimeter or a millimeter and a half. So when the paint starts to rub off, I mean, you know, that's not really a big degradation to the carabiner, but it is something for you to pay attention to. So I don't know if you can see this, but there is a definite wear mark on this, um, on this carabiner. Um, and so as it starts to groove out, it will start to do two things. One, it starts to weaken the, the, uh, the strength of the carabiner. And the other thing 
is it actually starts to, you can't, you can't see this, but there is a sharp piece on this and that can start to tear down the rope. So uh, when inspecting, you want to look for where, and then you want to see if the gate works. So this one just doesn't close um, reliably. And so that's one that I'm going to want to inspect. And if I can clean it, that's great. But this one I tried to clean, it's still garbage. So this one I retired. Okay, are there any questions out there? All right, cool. If there are any questions, feel free just to type them into the deal and um, want to make sure that you get the information uh, that you came here to learn. Okay, so let's go back to the slideshow. Okay, so we talked about HMS, we talked about Ds, talked about connectors and specialty carabiners, and now we're going to go to the next thing. Okay, ropes. Okay, so to be honest, like you might not need a rope for a while. And if I were you, I would just make friends with people that do have ropes because they're expensive. Um, but if you're in the market for a rope, I do want to give you an idea of some things to think about. So again, top of your list, you want one that's UIA and CU approved. Um, and then what are all these numbers? So here's an example of the of a sterling rope that um, that just has a ton of data on it. And I want to give you the tools to be able to decipher these things so you can decide which rope is for me. Um, so uh, across the top, it says 9.5 Infinity Dry. So uh, 9.5 is uh, in millimeters. So it's basically nine and a half millimeters is the diameter. Um, and then Infinity is just the name of the rope. And then dry is means that there is a dry treatment on the sheath. So ropes have two parts to them. There's the inner core, which is like a bunch of like yarn woven cords into a larger core. And then there's the sheath on the outside. The sheath protects the core, pretty straightforward. Um, and then on that sheath, they've treated it with a chemical that will help repel water and keep it a little cleaner. Uh, all right, moving down, there's like a one, a big circle around it. That means this is a rated single rope. Um, so that means you can take full whippers uh, on this rope and with just the one strand and you are going to be okay. Okay, so the next one down on that right on that left column is 70 M. So again, metric system 70 meters. Um, so 70 meters has kind of become like the new standard. Um, 50 meters was kind of the, the standard in some other eras that we came from 60 became the standard and now kind of 70 is a standard. I will tell you a lot of cliffs around here, you're only going to need like a 50 meter rope. So if you want, um, if you want a shorter rope uh, and you don't want to have to haul 70 meters everywhere you go, maybe get a, maybe just get a 60, but this one in particular is 70 meters. Uh, the next one is UIA falls. So this one's been rated for eight to nine UIA falls. What does that mean? Um, so they do a lot of drop tests. So they'll drop 50 kilogram weight. And I think it goes two meters and then the rope catches that fall. And so this is rope has been tested and between eight and nine big falls, um, that's when the rope probably should be considered to be retired. So these would be what are called factor two falls. And so that means um, that there is maximum acceleration of the climber following, falling. There's lots of slack in the system. And then it comes to a sudden end, which that's what you want. You want the climber to not hit the ground. Um, and so um, there is a lot of like concern about like, well, this is only going to take eight or nine falls. Top rope is not a problem. This will take a million top rope falls. But if you're on lead uh, and you take some really big long falls, you need to make sure that you're inspecting this rope um, regularly and kind of think about like, uh, uh, and, and that's the other thing, ropes should be retired. It's the same kind of fabric stuff. It's five years, you should be inspecting it every year. And then after 10 years, it needs to go in the garbage. All right, so the next one, um, impact force, uh, it's not really that important. Um, elongation, just know that dynamic ropes stretch 
And then this is going to stretch 6.5% of its length. Um, the next one is proportion of the sheath. So 40% of the rope is sheath, 60% is the core. Makes sense. Um, 9.5 is the millimeters. And just know that there's a one millimeter allowance. Um, and so that doesn't mean that you're getting an 8.5, but sometimes, uh, you know, ropes can be slightly off. And is there any way to really know? No, we're hoping that these manufacturers are giving a high standards to these ropes that are then certified with these companies and that they are what they say. Um, the weight, 59 grams per meter. Again, if weight is important to you, getting out to the crag, that's fine. I just know that that's how much this weighs. Um, this is how much, one and a half percent is how much water it's gonna absorb per meter. Um, and so with a dry treatment, it's just gonna not absorb as much water. One and a half percent is pretty good. Um, Elongation, we're going to skip that one. Sheath slippage. So a lot of times the sheath and the core will slip from each other. Um, and according to this manufacturer, they're going to say zero millimeters of this sheath is going to slip. So that's great. Okay, any questions about ropes? Okay, let me take a second. Um, so, so this is my gym climbing rope. And I do recommend, and again, this is kind of uh, an added expense, but I do recommend having a separate gym rope and a separate crag rope. Um, this rope is a 9.8. Um, it's, so it's pretty burly. You could even get a 10 for the gym, and that's fine. And you want just like a, a burly rope that you can slam around in the gym, and that feels kind of nice in your hand. That's really all you need. So this one is a 40 meter and you just want to double check with your gym to make sure that it will be able to reach uh, up and down to the top of the wall and back. So most gyms, 40 meter ropes is kind of what you're looking for. Okay, next. All right, so just a, some quick um, rope inspection stuff. Um, and so there are some things that will make your rope uh, It'll bring its end to uh, more quickly. So on that first one, it gives you some criteria. If it's fuzzy, kind of like my harness, my belay loop, it's all right. Um, it, yeah, different versions of fuzzy. And you can see that they're getting a green check. And then that really one where you, it's actually the sheath and the core separating, that's going to get a, a no-go. Um, you can see as it gets more and more frayed where the core is sticking out, that's not good. Um, that blue background one, or you can kind of see the discoloration of the two ends, that's fine. Um, that uh, one in the middle is uh, where, the, where you, it's taken a big whip and it's actually like snapped some of the, the cords in the middle. And so you get uh, what's called a core shot. Uh, the other ones down in the middle are things that, you know, get exposed to like uh, acid or bleach or something that's like dyeing the color and, and destroying the, uh, the polyester or the, the nylon that is made in, in these ropes. So again, inspecting your ropes is a critical part of uh, being a good uh, climber. Okay, blade devices. Um, just know that there are kind of two uh, and we're going to specifically talk about assisted braking devices. So just know that there are kind of two families. One is mechanical assisted braking devices and passive assisted braking devices. And notice I'm not using automatic braking devices because those don't exist. So assisted braking devices is kind of what we're talking about. So Grigri's uh, is kind of the standard that we're all familiar with, uh, but it is not an automatic device. It is assisted with your hand on the brake steering. So I've got a few examples um, and I'll kind of come back to this carabiner. So let's just take a look um, at how this one works. of rope when you can never find the end. Did I see it? 
it's Jill. Okay, so yeah, when we load this rope, or I'm sorry, when we load the, our Grigri, we put the uh, Frano on. This goes to my climber. This is my brake strand. And uh, the Freno is basically kind of just doing its thing, like any normal carabiner. Uh, but where it really comes into play is, it's one of the challenges with the, the Grigri is that when I pull this back, there's no way to regulate the speed other than to govern it. But if I pull this thing all the way back, my climber is going to hit the ground. Um, and so, um, so that's why the, they also, Grigri came out with the Grigri Plus. So it has a, a, basically a governor on it that when you pull it back and the rope starts to travel through the device, it will automatically lock off. But here I have just a regular Grigri. And so on the lower, when I pull the lever back, I'm also going to put the rope through this latch and I can get like some additional friction with this. It's pretty cool. Um, and I'm also the Grigri kind of requires me to run the rope over this plate. And when I put the rope into the side latch, conveniently, it not, it wants to the rope to run exactly over the wear bar, which is awesome. So I'm, it's actually going to extend the life of my Grigri um, when it is doing, the rope is running over the exact spot that it needs to run over. Um, and then this is a, a two-stage locker. So it's giving me like plenty of security. So you can see how when you put like these two things together that they're actually pretty powerful. Now the, the challenge with the Grigri has always been, well, how do I effectively lead belay um, with this device? Um, and the history of the Grigri in leading has had some unfortunate tales. Um, so as the, as the education, as the technology has advanced, the education has had to as well. So this is an example of when education kind of lags behind technology. Um, and so the way, the proper way to uh, lead belay is to you know, hold the device with, in this case, right-handed, if you're left-handed or SOL. Um, and you're going to put your thumb over the cam cam device and I'm going to hold holding the brake strand with three fingers and putting my thumb on the cam and that allows me to feed out slack which is helpful and then if a fall the idea is that my thumb isn't so aggressively pushing down here on the cam that it won't allow it to pop off. So I, I don't want to be pushing so hard here that it will prevent the Grigri from doing the thing that it does, which is assist in the break in breaking. So the, while the Grigri is awesome, it has some shortcomings. And you as a as a user of a device need to be aware of, of those shortcomings and prevent um, prevent those shortcomings from becoming uh, a story that you have to tell. Uh, the other ABD is that I'll show you is the Birdie. Birdie is made by Bial. That's a French company. They mostly make ropes. Um, but one of the things that is different about these two devices is that this one takes skinnier ropes. Um, and so I like that because it gives me a little bit more uh, flexibility. What are we doing on time? Um, so one of the things I like about this device more than the Grigri is its ability for me to feed slack out without having to defeat the device with my thumb is much easier. So I give this device to a new climber. So if I'm your friend who's been climbing for a while and I'm taking you out to the crag, I'm going to give you this device. I'm going to give you this carabiner. Um, and so for the reasons that we talked about of why this type of carabiner is great, this carabiner, this device is also awesome because it feeds slack real well. And I don't have to tell you, give you this big complicated lesson about how to put your thumb over the thing. So I like this one. All right, we're going to keep going. Go to Jess. Um, okay. 
So let's talk a little bit about ways to set the leader up for success. Um, so uh, a couple of those is to uh, do all the work that is required for the leader to get on the rope. Uh, to get on rope and get on the sharp end and start leading. And so what that means is when you get to the crag, you stack the rope like immediately. You get out your uh, rope tarp. You can go ahead and tip it down for a sec. I'll just tell the share. Can you stop the share? Yeah. So you're going to stack the rope. And what that means, and the first thing you're going to do, and this is one of the knots that we'll learn, is you're going to tie, that I'm going to encourage you to learn, we're not going to spend a lot of time, is to tie a double or triple fisherman. So just a stopper knot. So the way I do that is just like that. I've got a stopper knot. And I'm going to stack the rope just like this until the other end comes out and I am actively pushing any twists out with, in this case, my left hand. So I stack it with my right hand. So this sets up my climber for success so that I don't have to sit here and do this while they're on belay. And it actually creates uh, another layer of security for my climber. Can you imagine trying to do this, undo this rat's nest uh, while they're on? It's not great. So anyway, you stack the rope until uh, till the, till the climber climbing in comes out. Look at that now, that's a good time. Um, and then you have them, you have the end that they're gonna tie into just right on top so that they can grab it and tie in. So look at this like very compassionate and necessary service that you're providing for your climber. And uh, I would put it on a tarp. So it would then kind of look like something like this. I would have this spread out. Um, uh, so the tarp is helpful just to keep the rope clean. Um, and uh, it kind of like creates an opportunity that if you need to move this pile, that you can just move the tarp without then having to either like sort of scoop this yarn ball up and hopefully get it to where you need it. So the other thing that you can do, and go ahead and put the screen up. Uh, no, you can do this. So the other thing that you want to do is figure out where the route is. So, um, so if I'm, if the route is kind of, you know, to my right here, I don't want to set my belay station out over here. I want to figure out where, where is my climber going and where is a good spot for me to stand to begin the belay process. So you can already be thinking about these things as a way to set your climber up for success. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. Or there is something else on this one. Let me switch over. Okay, yep. Yeah, so uh, the other thing is as they're getting racked up, getting the gear on their loop, you can start looking up uh, the route in a guidebook. I recommend that everybody has a guidebook uh, or on Mountain Project. Um, but a guidebook is really helpful because it's generally written by locals that are know the area really well. So you're looking up the route, you're sharing data, like, oh, it looks like, see, I can see 10, 10 bolts on this one. So you're gonna need at least 10, probably 11 or 12 quick draws and, or oh, that crack looks like it kind of goes this way. And so just being attentive to where, to communicating some information. And the other thing I want to do is make a plan. So you're going to ask questions like, um, do you have what you need to build it, an anchor? And um, they're either going to tell you like, well, I don't really know what's up there. Or in the guidebook, you could read it and it might tell you. Um, but you want to know if you're going to be taking them off belay uh, and they're going to be rappelling down or, they, or they're going to lower. So this is another skill and a communication piece that you're going to have to work out with your partner. But having a plan and knowing what's going to, what the anticipated plan is once they leave the ground is, is really helpful and you can set them up to succeed. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go over this. 
Um, but just know that there are some principles uh, for belaying and they're critical for you to master. Uh, these are like essential uh, outdoor climbing skills. And these are the things you need to work out in the gym and feel really comfortable um, doing these, do, uh, practicing these skills. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm actually not gonna teach you how to do these. There are a lot of really good resources online. Uh, actually, REI has a really good series on knot tying. Um, and, you know, I recommend you finding uh, knot tying videos that, that help you out. Um, and so I did want to kind of show you a few examples just to give you an idea of um, different benefits uh, of different knots and hitches. So here I have two different hitches. Uh, this is a... Uh, this is the climb heist, which I don't have listed. Uh, it's a friction hitch, and so when it pulls, it prevents uh, it sliding up and down. And then uh, this would be like in rappelling. Uh, you would use this as a as a third hand. This is, session is not on rappelling, uh, but hopefully a future one could be. Uh, this is the auto block, which also is a friction hitch that doesn't allow. Uh, advance advancement on the rope unless you want it to. So it does slide, but it also grabs. Um, and then, yeah, so those would be repelling. There's also some other advanced skills that you can kind of use those for, but just know that they're, they're good for repelling. Uh, this is a clove hitch. Uh, and so um, this is a, an important one to tie, to connect to yourself to an anchor or to the, maybe to the ground or into a system where you want, um, you are connected to something and you don't want the rope to advance. Uh, but if you want to get the, your leash or whatever a little bit longer, you can just push more rope through and then pull it tight and you're reconnected. So it's like an adjustable, an adjustable knot, if you will, but it's a hitch. Um, here we have a figure eight on a bite just an important one to know, and then uh, an overhand on a bite. So these, are, again, are just like critical knots that you're going to need to know as you advance uh, from gym to crack. Uh, OK. OK, so let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of the, the ethics of the crag. And um, and uh, a lot of a lot a lot of people have caught on to like a leave no trace ethic, but I just want to hit on a couple things. So leaving what you find um, is an incredible an important piece. So um, you know flowers and rocks and things, just leave those things out there. Uh, I'd say the biggest pet peeve I have about uh, people I see at the crag is this trash that they leave behind. And oftentimes it's just like itty bitty stuff, and so we've got to be real. Um, thoughtful about, you know, bringing, bringing a trash bag, bring a Ziploc bag that's only for trash. The other thing is planning ahead is, is critical because you have to bail on a route, leaving gear behind, or you have to escape quickly. You might just leave a bunch of stuff around. Um, and so planning ahead and, ha and knowing kind of your route and what you're, you're going to do will allow you to, to make a, a, a quick and organized exit. Uh, using established trails, if you go to a lot of national parks, it is a spider web of trails. And so, um, especially here in, in uh, the greater Portland area, some of the trails are in terrible condition. Uh, and so really like staying on the maintain, on the, on the path is really critical. All right, so pee pee and poo poo. Um, kind of gone are the days of going out into the woods and pooping uh, and burying it. We know nobody's doing that. Um, we know, like, you know, you go there and see uh, toilet paper all over a crag. That's generally what's happening. So my encouragement to you is go to the bathroom in the outhouse um, and even telling your partner like, hey, this is probably the last toilet. Um, we should probably use it. The other thing is I always carry a wag bag uh, in my backpack. So if things get real uh, and I'm not close to a toilet, this is what I'm turning to. And so the reality is, is if we're, uh, we're pooping all over our crags, and that's going to become a, a huge problem. And we want to eliminate and remove our human waste. Okay, 
Next thing, um, not all crag dogs are, not all dogs are good crag dogs. So keep yours on a leash. Uh, if your dog is anxious uh, when the, you're not there, imagine how they're gonna feel when you get 16 feet off the ground. They're gonna freak out. So if you keep them on a leash uh, or keep them at home, generally you will avoid uh, some behavioral problems that I've observed with Craig. All right, limit your impact on other climbers. So keep your music at home. Uh, leave your gear tidy, keep it all bundled together in your pack if possible. Um, and then bring, if you bring children, and you should, um, bring entertainment for them. Uh, nothing is more annoying than uh, parents trying to parent their child while they're 20 feet off the ground and or their spouse is also tied to them. And so they can't do anything uh, or intervene or do the compassionate parenting that they normally do uh, and so bring entertainment for your kids or get them on a rope, all those kinds of things. Okay, don't throw rocks. Trundling is what that's called and rocks hurt people. There you go. Uh, wear a helmet. People trundle, wear a helmet. Uh, don't monopolize a route. So uh, don't just put a rope up and then just leave it for hours. When you're done, take the rope down, move on to the next thing. Um, uh, climbing crags are first come first serve. So my strategy is actually to put my tarp and rope on top. So when I get to a spot, drop the tarp and immediately put that rope out. And that basically is a signal to whoever comes next that, that I'm, I'm in line here. So it's a helpful thing to kind of get, uh, to sometimes be organized enough where you can do that and you don't have to like pull everything out of your pack. Okay, uh, when it comes to uh, traveling the approach, so smaller parties yield to bigger parties, downhill traffic yields to uphill traffic. Okay, next. Um, okay, so here are some examples of some educational and social organizations that will help you um, make connections. So Mazamas is a big one. Uh, sometimes those courses are hard to get in and um, it's really helpful when, let's see, you guys can, which is right, right, so it's a, let's see. Yeah, all right, I think I'm all right. Um, so these organizations are educational institutions that are good, also good like social clubs. Um, and just a plug, the American Alpine Club is running the Craggan Classic at Smith Rock, October 1st through the 3rd. It is a good time. They bring good speakers out. You can pay to get uh, some professional, like they'll have some professional climbers out there teaching courses. It's fun, so check that out. Um, obviously we've got climbing gyms that you can meet people. Uh, Planet Granite will make an announcement over the, uh, the loudspeakers for you to belay date someone um, and, uh, you know, see if there's a connection. Maybe you can um, find a future climbing partner. Um, and so take advantage of that. Uh, the other thing is when you're at your gym, get belay certified, get lead certified and buy some of your own gear. You will become a much more valuable partner uh, if you can kind of contribute to that relationship. And, and also you'll be a safer climber. If you have these tools in your back pocket, you're going to be um, somebody that people will want to climb with more frequently because they know you'll take care of them. Okay. Um, okay, so I've climbed internationally. And so some of the things that, uh, so sometimes you meet people and 40 minutes later, you're going to climb with them. So there's some things that I've learned to try to identify who do I want to climb with and who do I don't. Um, so some strategic questions that you can Think about is like how long have you climbed? How long have you had this harness? How long have you had this rope? Like those kind of things. Have you ever climbed here before? Have you ever climbed this route before? Uh, have you ever uh, climbed this style of climbing before? Um, then you can also say like, well, this is the kind of partner I'm looking for. I want to do. Uh, I want to climb in these areas. I want to do this style of climbing, and um, and I have these weekends open. So. This is the kind of thing that, I, that I'm looking for. So you can be strategic and direct about those things. Uh, where did you learn to climb? How, uh, like, what are your strengths? Like those kinds of things. Um, and then the other thing is while you're at the crag, you wanna make sure you're, talk, you're speaking the same language. So generally it's on belay, belays on, climbing, climb on, slack, take, those kinds of things. But not everybody learns that. Um, in fact, a lot of European countries, they do things differently. They don't tie in with the figure eight, they tie in with the bowl. Um, and so just making sure that you're, you are speaking the same language. And as I mentioned earlier, that you're making a plan of how everybody's gonna make it back down to earth. The sun is really on me. 
Okay, so uh, I want to encourage you, uh, give you some guiding principles to support your learning. And uh, so perfection isn't possible. So go slow because climbing is serious fun. Um, so it is both serious business and it is also fun because gravity never takes a break. So when you get in its clutches, uh, it just does what it does. It's not cruel. It's not um, vengeful. It just does what it does. And so uh, you want to put yourself in a situation where you've gone through repetitions. Uh, you've um, learned the skills that you need to learn. You've, you have the right gear. Holy cow. <laughs> Let's turn this. Staring into the heart of the sun. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so go slow and, and, and also, so it's serious and it's fun. Uh, the other thing is be curious when you're, when you're with a partner or in an educational setting, just like ask a ton of questions. Um, and you know, for some personality types, it might be difficult to be assertive and say like, can you say that again? Or, you know, just those types of things that will help you take responsibility for your own learning. And also just be willing to say like, okay, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what you said, because there's nothing climbers more like more than inside vernacular. So if you can think about all the things you've heard climbers say, um, there's a lot of like inside baseball, inside talking kind of stuff. So to be willing to, to speak up for yourself and say, I don't know what you mean. Can you explain that in a different way? So the other thing is that the internet is a wasteland of, of old and uh, wrong material. And so even if a YouTube video has 600,000 views, it doesn't mean that it is a good video. So find sources that you trust. Um, and then one of the most important things is work on, and which is great about the gym, is just work on your movement in a rock. Uh, your first line of safety is your feet. So if you don't fall, then some of the other stuff uh, you only need during the lower, or you know, you'll, you'll need that safety to come in other ways. Um, so go slow. You know, work on your feet, be curious, act direct questions, find good resources. Uh, these are all kind of ways that you can support your own learning. Just... Okay, so here's some, here's some, uh, a list of, of resources. So the Petzl website, um, they actually have some really good, really simple. And again, this is an organization or a manufacturer that sells to, you know, a hundred different countries. And so they have diagrams and pictures that are very simple and very useful um, that in communicating a clear message that doesn't need language per se. So, um, so they've got a lot of really good resources. American Alpine Club, uh, you can find one of the members um, here in Portland. I am the co-chair. Um, we have not done a good job of, of doing things here in Portland. So hopefully uh, after uh, sort of things come back to normal, we can kind of get back to social outings, connections, and helping link people together uh, to find mentors in climbing. Uh, they also put out an accidents and incidents book uh, that will highlight uh, themes of things that are going wrong in the Alpine world, giving you tips and tools on how to not do those, not do those things. Um, there's a couple Instagram accounts. Um, Dale Remsberg and Cody Brand Bradford are both uh, AMGA guides. The AMGA website posts um, uh, tips and techniques. Uh, Brown Girls Who Climb is another like affinity group that, that connects and highlights underrepresented uh, communities. And then a local uh, website and Instagram account is Alpine Savvy. And I don't remember the guy's name that runs it in Portland, but his content is very good. Okay, next. Let me get okay, so what's next? So you, you buy a harness, you buy a rope, um, you have some carabiners. So the next thing is really figuring out what would be called lead following. Um, and so this is kind of the, some of the stuff you'll learn in like a lead climbing class in the gym. So I recommend that you get signed up and, and begin that journey. Um, sometimes they're in classes, sometimes you can only take the test. And so ask the gym provider that you're at, like, hey, do you offer a, a class and can I take it? Um, so the things that you're going to learn in that class are like clipping quick draws. What is a Z clip? What is a back clip? What is a uh, lead bling look like? And going back to our conversation about assisted braking devices, like is that the device 
that you feel more comfortable with and you have experience with. Um, and then, uh, yeah, giving slack as opposed to just pulling it in and, and uh, like you would on a top rope. Um, ways to support the, the lead climber, uh, better communication, uh, cleaning uh, a top rope anchor. So leader climbs up, creates an anchor, comes down, you go up on top rope, clean the anchor, come down. It's kind of annoying if the leader has to climb twice. And so these are the, these are the skills that again can help you set you up for success uh, at the crack. And then uh, your ability to like clean pro and so nuts, cams, some of those things that we didn't get to um, are also important and then repelling. Um, and there are lots of ways to repel that get you down safely. And then there are some best practices that are going to be really good for you to learn. Okay, so that comes to the end of our time. What if any questions exist out there? Standing by. Yeah. You're be minimized to show me, apparently. So maybe cut that. Yeah. Switch the screen. Oh. Yeah. He wants to see leading and paying slack quickly. Okay, cool. Let's do it. Yeah, let's switch. <laughs> Thanks for your patience on the lighting. Okay, I'm just gonna throw my harness on. Do this the real way. Okay, so here's my Grigri. This is my climber. Jess, would you like to hold it up for my climber? So I'm gonna check to make sure that this is all loaded correctly. And so I'm checking to see if it's locked, that the rope is going to my climber. And that when it pulls, that it, uh, that it arrests, it does its assisted braking. So that's great, now we can climb. So when I'm paying out slack, the recommended way to pay slack out on a Grigri is actually just like this. This is the recommended way to do it. Problem is, if my climber is moving kind of any faster than that, it's going to start binding up and I'm going to short rope them and maybe pull them off the wall. And so, so the recommended way to use this is to with an open hand, I'm putting under this wear bar, putting my fingertips under the wear bar, and I'm maintaining a hold onto the brake strand. And then I'm taking my thumb and putting it over this is a this device cams. This is how the brake works. And so I'm putting my thumb over it. And so I'm still have my brake hand on and I'm able to defeat the device with my thumb, which is fine. So I'm able to keep it from doing its job so that I can allow my climber to move up the wall. And now if he takes a bit, if she takes a big fall, my thumb comes off, my brake hand stays on, and I'm able to kind of keep keep it going. So let's pull this out a bit. So let me show you what that looks like kind of in fast forward here. So I got the position figured out. And so paying slack out, I can do this actually really fast. Um, and it allows me to, to continue to maintain the properties of safe play, which is keeping a brake hand on and, uh, and being able to manage, manage slack. That answer your question, Jeremy?
And then I'll just, for funsies, uh, I'll kind of just give you a demonstration of like the difference between the Grigri and the Birdie. Um, so like it moves pretty smoothly through here, but again, like anytime there's an acceleration of the rope and it doesn't even have to be that sharp, it, uh, it, will, it will break. So the birdie on the other hand, birdie on the other hand is a lot more play. I can really pay slack out pretty quickly. Um, and it's just a slightly smoother action. Without actually it, it finding it. I mean, obviously it will do its job, but um, I just have found that this is a little bit more. I don't know if you can see that. A little bit more easy to pay slack out quickly. There you go. Are there other questions out there? Well, if you're interested in following me uh, on Instagram, I'm at uh, Morel Jonathan, uh, M O R E L L Jonathan, J O N A T H A N. And um, if you're interested in, in chatting more, you can also reach out to me via email. I'm at Jonathan, J O N A T H A N, dot Morel, M O R E L L, at iCloud.com. Happy to continue the conversation. This mentoring relationship is what it's all about. And um, I don't know everything, but I am happy to continue your journey towards mastery. And I hope you learned something tonight. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. I'll send out a recap um, after this with all of Jonathan's contact information. So thanks for joining us. Jonathan, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge yeah, and yeah. experience with us. He's been climbing for a long time, so we're super happy to have him on. Um, and we'll post this to the YouTube channel. So if you missed anything or need to like rewind, there'll be an option for you. Um, so thanks for joining us. Enjoy your evening and we'll see you around. Cheers.